That song right there, sometimes I think we don't really understand how much we need the shepherd. There's a line in that song where it said, life is like a winding pathway. And I know we sit here and we think we know what tonight's going to hold. We know what tomorrow's going to hold. We've got our schedules and we keep all of that. But nobody knows what tomorrow holds. And... Um, Sometimes we can be our worst enemy in all of that because we're so presumptuous that everything's just going to be fine and nothing bad's going to happen. And that you know, maybe something good's getting ready to happen. We don't know, but we just, we just keep this, this grind. And we, we think we've got it all figured out, and nobody has it figured out. But the Lord, and He is our shepherd, and He's the one that leads us in this life. And, and what you just heard them singing about is the great key to life because we just don't know. Who, by the way, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel 13. This matter of leading, who, who would have ever dreamed that tonight while we sit here <clears throat> that American warplanes and Russian warplanes would be using the same airspace? Who, who would have ever dreamed that? Who would have ever dreamed that Russia would basically fill up the vacuum and move America out of the Middle East overnight? And by the way, if you even remotely know anything about Bible prophecy, you need to understand Gog and Magog. You understand about the bear that gets hungry. He comes down out of the north and captures this area. Russia needs the Middle East. And no one in the Middle East likes Israel. What we basically have done in just a few weeks' time is given Iran a nuclear bomb and let Russia move closer to Israel. I'm just telling you, Jesus Christ is coming again. And they were singing that song we don't know what tomorrow holds, and life is like a winding road, a pathway. And the only way we get any peace is just hold the hand of the Savior. Take my hand, precious Lord. How many believe in the unseen hand? I do. I do. Amen. These are exciting days we're living in, aren't they? And uh, may God help us to keep focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the answer to it all. We've been in this series First Samuel, I don't even know if I ever gave it a title. We just flew in on it several months ago. and We've been uh, teaching out of First Samuel. It's a transitional book. There's a lot happening. The, the major thing is this. Uh, the light was about to go out in Israel. They'd had no word from God. Samuel comes in on the scene. A child. Eli is knocked off of his priestly throne. Samuel now becomes the prophet and priest of the nation. It is a theocracy. And it is Samuel that's going to move, by default, move the nation of Israel from theocracy or God-led to a monarchy, which means a king-led. So this is where it all happens right here in this book. You're about to see Saul fail, and tonight we'll see the beginnings of his failure. And you're about to see this puppet king replaced with one of the most wonderful kings that ever ruled this world, King David. And... Uh, I'm excited about our study tonight. Look at chapter 1, or chapter 13, verse 1. Let's stand together, please, read him God's Word. We'll read down through verse number 15. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 13, <clears throat> verse number 1. Saul reigned one year. Now, by the way, just last week we talked about his inauguration. He didn't even get to speak at his own inauguration. Samuel got to speak. He got the last say before he turned the reins and leadership over to this young king. Verse 1, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the Mount of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah, that was his son, by the way, first mention here, uh, in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines. 
and that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves to, together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And there came up and, and pitched, uh, and they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward uh, from Beth Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and rocks and high places and in the pits. Some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad in Gilead. <clears throat> As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings, and the offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together in Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the command, commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not, be, now shall not continue. And the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. By the way, it's at this verse that the wheels start turning and the Spirit of God starts preparing a young shepherd boy on the side of a hill. Verse 15, Samuel rose and got him up from Gilgal into Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. I'll draw your attention to verse number 11. Let's read that together, verse 11. Ready? And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. We could say mistake number one, but it's probably mistake number two or three. Because the pendulum had already begun to swing. I'll speak on this subject for just a while tonight. The short rule of King Saul. Let's pray together. Now, Father, tonight though we have before us the example of a king, we can all take note by way of application of how people fall so fast and how Christians ruin their testimony and how the blessings are removed from them. Teach us, Lord, tonight from this passage, I pray, please. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. How does a man with the stature and position of King Saul fall so far so fast? He was head and shoulders above everybody. He had a Pepsi Dent smile. He had everything going for him. He was wealthy. Though it appeared he had some humility that we find out that was really a false humility. You say, preacher, now you had a few more years here to rule. What do you say he fell fast? Well, understand, he's only two years into this whole thing. And from this point on, the man's leadership as king was miserable. The years were miserable. We're going to read about those. He never got any footing after this because of some things that he did. The Bible says this, "...the pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall." And the seed of pride has been noticed in this man's life throughout our study of him. We saw this raising up in his head, and it appeared to be a false sense of humility. Now, I'm going to take a little time out here and make a statement. I don't mean to offend anybody, but understand, when I make this statement, I'm, I'm a, I'm a born-again Baptist. I'm not a Catholic. We have just witnessed about four or five days of the Pope being here in America. I personally believe it's a 
he exhibited a false sense of humility. You can say whatever you said wants to say. I, I watched part of it. And he, everybody was commenting on him driving around his little Fiat and all of that. Well, somebody had to think that up. Somewhere he had to say, I'm not driving around a limo. I'm going to ride a Fiat. And I understand. I know, I know what you're thinking. I, and I watched him as he kept his head bowed next to the president. And while the president was standing there, you know, enjoying all the pomp and circumstance, he kept his head bowed and all that. But I want you to understand something. This man is human just like anybody else. They say that he is the fourth most powerful man in the world. You think he don't know that? He has over 4 million followers on Twitter alone. And, and I just, I want you to know that, and I'm not trying to be a judge here, but he is the Pope. And if he's never put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ solely in his precious blood, he is a lost man. The Virgin Mary is not going to get him into heaven. Somebody say amen right there. Unless they've changed their doctrine. Now, I'm not judging them. I'm just saying the facts are the facts. And here's what I want to say. I want you to understand that it's, it's hard enough for a Christian not to be driven by pride, let alone an unsaved person. And so uh, this is borne out, really, with his speech when he failed, really, to protect any of the Catholics' doctrine on morality. He could have spoke out strongly against some things that America was doing and supported some of the priests in America as they tried to fight things like abortion on demand and gay marriage and so forth. And he did give a little lip service, but instead what he did was was support the liberal political agenda of America. Now, I said I'll say this. It is hard for anyone to be humble. But if you think that I think that the Pope is humble, you need to check out the way you think. Now, I said all that because it's classic sense of false humility. And that's what King Saul had. I believe personally, and I'm reading into it just a little bit, but King Saul was just waiting for the day that Samuel was out of the way because he wanted this thing all to himself. I can handle this now. And so before we get into the downfall of this leader, I want to make two introductory statements. Number one, we see in our text this. Saul could have made it. Saul could have been successful. I want you to look at verse 13 again. We read this, but he said, uh, he said and Sam, Saul, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. What was he saying? He was saying this. Look, uh, you know, you, you got off on a bad foot. None of this was your fault. The people are the ones that called for the king, like the rest of the nations. That wasn't your fault. I had to deal with it. And you were the one that was selected. And once you understand that you could have made it, the only thing you had to do was obey the commandments of God. That's all any of us have to do. The only thing Saul had to do was follow God's instructions. <laughs> and I want to say tonight, <laughs> that's all that any of us need to do in order to succeed. I want you to... Uh, Turn over to uh, just a few chapters over. Chapter 15, look, look what Samuel says here. Chapter 15, look at verse 22. Chapter 15, verse 22. Now he had another incident where he didn't tell the truth again. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord has a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of, God, of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. By the way, you ought to underline that in your Bible. He goes on to say this. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. What, what I'm saying is this. This message is for all of us. You can take a look at King Saul and say, well, you were arrogant. You could have made it, but you didn't obey the commands of God. We could point the finger right back at us. That's all we've got to do to make it in the Christian life. Your sacrifices are, are wonderful and all that. But they're not in your, in your work and your service to God. But they're not near as important as obeying God. You understand that you can put a big show on for anybody, but God knows the heart. The second thing I want to say, say is this. <clears throat> Saul could have made it, number one. But secondly, it was not easy for the preacher to confront this new king. What's, what Samuel had to do with Saul was not easy to do. Samuel had several difficult assignments. <laughs> his message as a young boy to Eli, as God was speaking to his heart about the man of God, it was a message of judgment, chapter 3, verse 13. And God was saying, 
in that dream that night to this young boy, I want you to go tell Eli that because he didn't make his boys obey God, I'm going to judge his boys and I'm going to judge him. Young Samuel was afraid to take that message to, to Eli, but yet God called on him as a young age to be his mouthpiece for him. I think of the second time he had to face uh, uh, the crowd of Israel denouncing them for their, their idolatry so that they might win again in battle. The third was this, that he, had to, uh, he was faced with being denied the position as a prophet and priest over Israel's demand to that they have a king like the other nations. And understand, it was very hard now for this old uh, man Samuel, the man of God, to go out and tell them, look, I'm going to give you your king, and I'm going to give you king only because God met with me and told me I'm supposed to do this. But I want you to understand, when you get a king, he's going to come and get your sons and take them to war. He's going to come and get your daughters and go put them in his house and make them work as slaves. He said he's going to tax you hard. I want you to understand, I'm going to give you your king, but you're going to get what you wanted. i said this several times. There's many times much, much better off to uh, want something you don't have and have something you don't want. And he was the man of God that had to stand in the gap and make up the hedge and tell this nation that they were making a terrible, terrible mistake. I think about uh, how he had now, uh, he had to call upon God uh, to, to tell this, uh, he's called upon by God to tell this new king that he was going to rip the kingdom from him and give it to somebody else that wasn't even a member of his family. You see, back in those days, it was tradition that once uh, the king took the throne, that his sons would succeed him, uh, as it was David and some others. But nevertheless, it wasn't going to be that way with Saul. Jonathan was not going to be the heir to the throne. He could have been. But this man of God had to go in and give bad news to this new king. Now, I want to stop making this statement. This is all introduction. From time to time, you are called upon to take the message of God to somebody that may not want to hear it. Number one, you understand this, that you are privileged by God to have a word from God. Don't ever draw back from that. In our soul winning, we're giving out a message that people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear that they're sinners, and they don't want to hear that hell is the penalty for our sin. They don't want to hear that. But understand, you and I are privileged and blessed of God to be able to have the message of God as ambassadors of God, the message of reconciliation to go to somebody and be able to tell them in the name of God that if they'll trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, they can have heaven for sure. We're privileged to have that. Anytime that you counsel your, your family or counsel other people regarding uh, the way that maybe they should live their life, anytime that you have a chance to do that, you're privileged to be able to do that as hard as it may seem. And the task fell on Samuel's shoulders. And it was not easy to confront him. May we remember that it's often the sad duty of those in leadership to pinpoint the problem with the people and to boldly deliver a message from God. I just spoke recently with a pastor, a friend, spent a lot of time with him on the phone with a terrible situation in his church that he has to confront it. He has to confront it. He cannot run from it. And I, I, I caught his tears and prayed with him on the phone just recently. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes you've got to give news that's not good news. By the way, on the Senate floor today, though I'm not a big fan of this guy, Senator John McCain stood on the Senate floor and he laced out our entire government because of what they're doing in the Middle East. If you didn't get a chance to hear that, it was on live. I was traveling to Nashville, uh, the hospital. It was live. If you didn't get a chance to hear that, you need to hear what that man, that veteran had to say of how we had soldiers that bled and died and took land in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, that whole area over there, and now we're giving it all back. Hear what the man had to say. That was not easy for him to say. But nevertheless, he had to say it. I'm just saying Samuel had the sad duty to look this king in the eye and said, You blew it, buddy. You made a terrible mistake. From this point on, his whole kingship changes. Now, let's look at what caused Saul's ministry as a king to be so short-lived. I'm going to give you three points. Leave a little white space there. You might want to make some notes. But number one, understand this. Number one, he had a desire to be popular. Would you write that down? He had a desire to be popular. This began welling up in him, and now he's been at the helm for two years. And we see something happen. These first couple verses is very important. 
We see here that it was Jonathan, his son, that defeated the garrison of the Philistines, not Saul. By the way, I understand that in, in the day, whenever, uh, whenever some general uh, has a big defeat of an enemy, often the president of the king got the glory for that. But the Bible's being very literal here for a reason. And I'm going to show you here tonight what I think. For you see, he had this desire to be popular. This, this defeating of this garrison of Philistines fired up the enemy. Now, the Philistines had not really invaded them. They had before, and, and Israel had already been, always been able to fight them off with the hand of God. So the Philistines, what they did was, they didn't necessarily live among them, but they camped around them, had these garrisons, these little camps of the enemy was camping all around them. And uh, Saul wasn't doing anything about it. And so his son, Jonathan, who is a mighty warrior, he said, I'm going to do something about it. My daddy's got 2,000 soldiers. I only got 1,000 soldiers. But I'm going to go whip up on this garrison of Philistines. And he did. And he, he, fought, he won, a, won a mighty, mighty battle there. And uh, what, he, what should have happened there is when the enemy was on the run, deal with it quickly, but Saul did not do that. Instead, Saul comes back. He blows the horn and tells everybody, I've won a great battle. And it blew up in his face. Now the enemy has time to gather together. Verse number 5, we see that they, they get fired up. They gather up a mighty army of 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in a multitude. I'm just saying you can look out over the, the land and just look like ants of, of soldiers everywhere. And we see also in verse 6, Saul now loses the loyalty of his soldiers that followed him. And we get down to the end of of our reading, verse number 15. After all of this, he only has 600 men, and they're distressed, and they're trembling, they're shaking in their boots. So I'm thinking right now, okay, Mr. Popularity, where's your army now? And I will tell you that it is true that pride does go before destruction. <clears throat> We're living in a generation, everybody wants to be popular, everybody wants to be number one, and uh, uh, everybody wants a celebrity leader. A lot I can say about that, I'm going to refrain. What we need is the opposite of that. This is all going on, not just in politics with the res resignation of John Boehner and they're going after now McConnell and all that. I I'm just saying all this bannering is going back and forth. I don't know who the next person should be. I all the president presidential candidates are out there and they're jockeying around and all that. But, but what bothers me more than politics is what goes on in our churches. Or worse yet, what goes on in fundamentalism? You see, we don't need a celebrity leader. We need a Christ-driven leader. And I understand how hard humility is, and the moment you get it, you know, you lose it. I understand all that. But uh, we need, what we need in our churches and what we need in our Sunday school classes and what we need in our, uh, to lead our, our nation one more time are people that have some kind of humility. I want to show you uh, the Bible way we can get that. I want you to turn back to Joshua chapter 4. In Joshua chapter 4, we see a, an interesting quality here that, that only God can do. And, and Moses, you understand, was going to pass off the scene. And it's going to be Joshua now that's going to lead the nation. And Joshua was concerned about the fact, what would the people follow me? And Moses told him, and God told him, look, the only thing you've got to do is just obey God. And, and uh, when we get to chapter 1, Moses, God tells uh, Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. And he said, uh, I want you to be strong and I'll never leave you nor forsake you. This book of law shall not depart out of their mouth. Be strong, he says. And we get over here and, and he uh, invades Jericho. And then they have the, the uh, miraculous uh, uh, the, uh, crossing of the uh, Jordan there. Look at chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verse 14. The Bible says this. Uh, after the defeat there at Jericho, verse 14, you ought to underline this in your Bible. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. If you read the entire book of Joshua, you'll see that he had a wonderful, successful uh, career in leadership and leading God's people. But I want you to understand it's God that magnified this man in the eyes of the people. You can't be self-promoting. 
You just can't. It's not going to serve us. It's not going to serve our nation well. It's not going to serve our churches well. It's not going to sh- sh- serve our movement well. I'm watching right now. Do you understand that in fundamentalism right now, we could very well be in the best place we could have been in years because we don't have any big leader. We need one leader, and that's Jesus Christ. What we need is the 9,000 independent fundamental Baptist churches in America. What we need is for them to follow Christ. And that's what this church needs. We need to follow Jesus Christ. Let Him lead us. Let Him exalt us. So we see here that this, this uh, young king had a desire to be popular. He wanted everybody to think that he was the one that had defeated the Philistines. Number two, he was disobedient to God's commands. This is very important. He was disobedient to God's commands. Um, he was told in chapter 10, verse 8, that there would be a set time that uh, he was to meet, Samuel was to meet with his new king, and whenever he would meet him in Gilgal, they would make the sacrifice there for him. So there was a rule between Samuel and the new king that he would go, the king would go to Gilgal and wait, tarry there seven days until the prophet arrived. That was the plan. That was the goal. We see that Saul waited exactly seven days and then he demanded the people to bring the animals to be sacrificed and he would just do it himself. Let's look at the note here. Verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. It came to pass as, that as soon as he made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, you ought to circle that word behold in your Bible, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. The Bible indicates here that as soon as Saul had completed his religious deed, on that seventh day, sometime later in the day, Samuel shows up. Patience is a virtue. The Bible says in Psalm 27, 14, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall... They, they, we should, I'm sorry, that's in his Isaiah passage. Psalm 27 says we should wait upon the Lord. So he uh, did his to the letter duty, and then he took matters in his own hands. Now, there's several things that should be noted here. First of all, number one, it was not, not Saul's place to do this. Number two, he was, it was an act of usurping God-given authority. God has a line. He has positions. He has lines of authority. Number three, it was an act of selfishness on Saul's part, arrogance to think that he could stand in the place of the priest and make the sacrifice. Number four, it was a dependence on a religious ritual, a good luck charm. Making that sacrifice did him no good. We need to be careful we don't get caught up in ritualism. Number five, and probably the worst thing is this, It was a positioning of religious authority. It's just what he was waiting for. Samuel doesn't show up. I don't need him. I'll do it myself. I don't need a preacher. I don't need a church. I don't need any rules. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. And understand, when you get to that place where nobody can tell you anything, You're in a terrible, terrible position. There's an obvious difference between Saul, King Saul, and King David when it comes to their relationship with their preacher. Once you turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 12, let me just touch on this briefly. 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel, David sins with Bathsheba. David's preacher was Nathan. They were childhood friends. Very, very close. Not too many people knew exactly what David had done, and David tried to cover up his sin by having having Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, killed in battle. Tried to cover it all up. But God knew. Because God knew, 
God told Nathan, the preacher, go deal with it. So he get to chapter 12, and he tells the story about the little lamb. You've read all that. David's anger is greatly kindled in verse 5, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, that man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Verse 7, and Nathan said to David, he used a little preaching message. He said, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee a master's house that goes on to say such and such a things. And he tells him the judgment he's going to have to bear now because of his sin. Watch how David responds. And David said, verse 13, and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. What am I saying? I'm saying this man had enough sense to repent. And here's one of the scariest things about this whole passage we're reading tonight. King Saul doesn't repent. He's confronted with the man of God. He's told by the man of God how foolish he's been. And the next thing you know, the preacher man walks away and Saul goes back to his business. It's a scary place to be when you don't repent. The Spirit of God speaks to your heart. This is the place, I believe, where we see this man's heart begin to harden. Beware when the Spirit of God points out your sin. You're on dangerous ground. Number three. Number one, we see that he had a desire to be popular. Number two, we see that he was disobedient to God's command. Number three, he was deceptive in his leadership. Now, we could go anywhere here and find this, but from the very get-go, Saul couldn't tell the truth. This will continue until the day he dies, even with the situation over in chapter 15 we just read with the Melekites. He's a plastic man. A man who the Bible said was once filled with the Spirit of God. And he's a plastic man now. He goes out to salute the man of God in verse number 10 like nothing's ever happened. I don't think he got it done because immediately the man of God starts talking and says, what have you done? Several things to note here. First of all, he was deceptive and dishonest with the people and who defeated the garrison. That's where it started. Secondly, he was deceptive. He was dishonest with the preacher. When the preacher came and said, and he said to him, he said, uh, I had to force myself to do it. By the way, and Samuel said, and Samuel said, what have you done? And he said, I had to force myself to do what I did. When he states to Samuel that he forced himself, it is telling us something that we need to know, and that's this. His conscience was bothered with what he did. When a person's making up his story on his feet, it's a sign that his conscience is bothering him. Those of you who have ra raised small children, you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their actions. Saul was the king, but he came out to salute like nothing had ever happened. And you understand that when this old man walked up, he noticed that the crowd was dispersed. He noticed that the people who were around him was trembling. They were scared to death. He smelled the smell of burnt beef when he walked into town. The smoke was still rising off the burnt sacrifice. You think that man of God didn't know what was going on? Let alone the fact that he was a man of God and God probably already told him what was going on? And then Saul said, I forced myself. Now this is crucial because whenever something begins to bother your conscience, that is the Spirit of God speaking to your heart. And this man didn't listen to the Spirit of God. And I think about all the times that we have an invitation here at this church. And I know the Spirit of God is working on the hearts of not just unsaved people, but saved people. And I'm saying to myself, how long can we harden our hearts toward the things of God? We see what happens when he was dishonest with the preacher. Three things right here. The Bible tells us, look at verse number 11. Saul said, what have you done? He said, well, he said, uh, uh, he said uh, the people scattered. He, he blamed the people that were scattered from me. He said, man, look, this, uh, there's so many people in that Philistine army. He said, I, I had to do something. I don't have anybody to fight. Secondly, he blamed the preacher. You didn't show up. 
You said you'd be here and you didn't show up. By the way, how many understand he did show up? And according to the context of the scriptures, he showed up probably right on time. Let me just put it to you like this. Saul did what he wanted to do. Saul did what he had put in his heart to do. He was driven to do it. Number three, he blamed the Philistines. He said, he said the situation is out of hand that I'm in. I just want to say that there's no situation that will ever dictate that you disobey the commands of God. How many have ever heard this little phrase, situation ethics? Hold your hand. Have you ever heard this situation ethics? Situation ethics is a, is a philosophy that says, well, I can do certain things that may be sinful. It depends on the situation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is a false philosophy. And I'm going to tell you, it's ruining us today in Christianity. There's a lot of Christians that are doing things right now that they would have never done years ago because they say this new culture and the new situation that's out there dictates that I change everything that I believe, be it gay marriage, abortion on the band, be it alcohol, be whatever it is, open marriages, whatever it is. I'm saying there are Christians that said, would have said, I would have never done that years ago, but now with this new culture, i got to do something. And they're changing their whole philosophy, their whole doctrine and position. Years ago, I had an older preacher tell me that God allowed him to get by with certain sins that he didn't allow others to get by with because he was God's pet. No, I'm sorry. It don't work like that. But even worse, I said he was dishonest with the people. He was dishonest with the preacher. He was dishonest with, with God thinking he could get by with his sin. But here's the one that breaks my heart. Fourthly, he was deceptive and dishonest before his own son, Jonathan. I don't have to guess why Jonathan allied with David later. Jonathan was a, he was a good young man. That's why David and Jonathan gravitated to each other. Because David could see something special in Jonathan. But Jonathan saw his dad's crusty heart like nobody else. He said, Dad, you didn't defeat that garrison. Now, I'll give you the credit if you want to get the credit, but Dad, just be honest with the people. We need to be careful how we handle matters in front of our children. Nobody's going to be perfect in this. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Your kids see right through. They're watching. Your grandkids, they're watching everything you do. I thought I was on my guard a lot as we were raising our son. But I'm going to tell you what. It is, it is amplified times 10 now that I have my grandson. I don't want him to ever say, my papa is a deceptive person. We should all want that. And I'm going to tell you why we're losing our kids in fundamentalism. Because they're not seeing true blue people. We're talking out both sides of our mouth. And there's a generation coming up behind us. They know better. And I want to challenge you in this tonight. Samuel said that Saul had done very foolishly. He had his chance and he blew it. What he was saying was this. That was dumb. What were you thinking? Well, this time Samuel and Saul had built a tremendous relationship. But now Samuel was no longer an asset to Saul. He had to get him out of the way. Samuel was too spiritual for Saul. And you'll notice sometimes when we have relationships that split up, Many, many times it's for that reason. Somebody else, somebody walks with God and the other person don't want to walk that close. And so relationships change. He said, you've done very foolishly. You had your chance. All you had to do was obey God. That's all he had to do. I don't know how much longer he needed to wait for Samuel, but he should have waited until he came. I want to say this. There's a statement is made here and there's so much more I could say I'm just going to knock out a few train cars here look at verse 11 I, 
as you read this, verse 10, Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. That means that it was his goal when they said, the man of God's in town, the man... He spun around from where that burnt sacrifice was with all those trembling soldiers. He spun around there, and, and he, it was his goal to go out and salute him and say, well, God bless you, Samuel. Come on in. It, it was his goal to put a smile on his face and act like nothing ever happened. I think contextually, before he could ever stick his hand out to shake the man's hand or hug him, he said, what have you done? It's almost like when you catch your kids in the middle of that mischief. Like the teacher leaves the classroom and they're coming back in and you hear all the carrying on in the classroom and you open the door and you say, what are you doing? What have you done? And that phrase, that question grabbed a hold of me and I thought, if God would ask you the same question tonight that Samuel was asked Saul, how would you answer? What have you done? Samuel approached Gilgal, Gilgal. He knew the answer. He knew something was wrong. He knew what happened. And so does your Heavenly Father. And I want to say this tonight. God always knows. And God always wins. What hast thou done? What have you done today? As you close your eyes tonight on your pillow... Ask yourself that question as your, far as your relationship with God. and What have you done? Have you done what God wanted you to do today? What have you done with the Word of God today? What have you done in your prayer life? What have you done with your life? Are you wasting your life? Are you about to throw it all away? Are you obeying God right now with what you are doing? Are you blaming others for your problems? What have you done right now? What are you doing? What are you doing for God? Short-lived, as you work your way through the rest of the kingship of King Saul, it just gets worse. It gets worse. All because Saul couldn't win over himself. Somebody asked D.L. Moody one time, they said, Mr. Moody, who is your biggest enemy? Mr. Moody said, the man who lives underneath this hat. And tonight, maybe that can be said of us. Let's don't blow the opportunity God has given us. Maybe that you're a choir member, you're a Sunday school teacher, you play one of our instruments, you work a bus route here in our church, maybe you work in our school, you're a teacher, maybe you're a guest tonight, and, and you have some responsibility for God. God has given you a tremendous place of leadership. He gives you that chance. And the only thing we've got to do is obey God. Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let me ask you just a couple questions. First of all, regarding salvation, what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you obeyed Him and followed Jesus Christ and trusted Him as your Savior? Tonight, what have you done?